Well, coming to the Gospels should be the frequent delight of every Christian. Uh, We believe that all of Scripture points to Christ, but it's in the Gospels where we find most clearly his birth and his life, his teaching, his death, his, his resurrection described for us. These eyewitness accounts. Uh, and we get to see and, and hear the Son of God in the flesh. These are the books of the Bible. To which probably most of us turn to as brand new Christians. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And we should love to keep turning to them. That we are never too big for the Gospels. Uh, You never outgrow the Gospels. And Matthew particularly is a tremendous eyewitness account of the life of Jesus Christ. It's both the longest and the fullest Gospel accounts. Uh, And it's about 12 months exactly since we were last in the book of Matthew together. And we were looking at the parables of Matthew 13. And we return this morning pretty much where we left off, uh, turning to chapter 13, uh, verses 51 to 58. And maybe in doing so, some of you are wondering, well, why are we picking things up here, Robert? Why haven't we gone to the start of Matthew? Uh, What about the first 12 chapters? What about really the first half of the book? Well, this has been a bit of a quandary of mine since coming to Lisburn, because in my previous congregation, I, I preached through Matthew 1 through to 12. And I've thought rather than recycling that material and serving up secondhand sermons, uh, my preference is to press on into new material, new territory, Uh, And if you wish, if you really wish, I think all 50 of those sermons are available online, uh, whether sermon audio or YouTube, uh, you could fill a day or two if you wanted. Uh, But this morning, we certainly aren't any lesser off picking things up here uh, towards the end of chapter 13. In fact, we're actually coming to a very significant juncture in the whole book As we come to the end of this chapter, we're leaving behind a substantial section which has been focused on the wonderful teaching ministry of Jesus. Uh, The Sermon on the Mount, the parables and so on. And and people have been flocking to hear him. Uh, They've been coming in their crowds to see his miracles. Uh, You could say at this point, Jesus is at the peak of his popularity. Uh, In fact, at the start of this chapter, uh, the crowd on the beach listening to him is so large, he has to get into a boat and go out into the water a little bit in order that he's got a bit of space to teach them. Uh, so, So you could say he's reaching celebrity status at this stage in his ministry. But we know his popularity will not last. And actually, this morning's passage really starts to introduce strong ill feeling toward Jesus. The mood towards Jesus is beginning to change. From now on, in Matthew's gospel, there's going to be increasing opposition. So much so, in time, it will lead to the cross. So our passage really is something of a hinge upon which the whole book of Matthew turns. Uh, Moving from increasing popularity uh, to increasing hostility. So it's not a bad stage uh, to resume a series in the gospel. He's just given in this chapter seven parables. uh, The parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast, uh, the parable of the hidden treasure... Uh, The parable of the pearl of great price and the parable of the dragnet. And as I say, it was was about a year ago, September, October, November last year, when we looked at these parables together. 
the focus this morning is on how people respond. How people respond to the teaching ministry of Jesus. Responding to the teaching of Jesus. And there are two very contrasting responses before us in this passage. Firstly, we see some have the honor of setting forth treasure. Really, this is verses 51 and 52. Some have the honor of setting forth treasure. In verse 51, Jesus asks the disciples, have you understood all of this, all these parables? He clearly doesn't want them just to be merely interested or merely appreciative of his ministry. He wants these things to sink down. Uh, He wants them to impact them, to change them. Uh, Have you understood all these things? And they reply with one accord, yes, yes. And Jesus seems to accept their answer at face value. And that's maybe a little surprising for us. Because we know these disciples. And we know down the track there's going to be significant misunderstanding coming to light. Uh, There's confusion ahead for them. Uh, Yes, they may not have understood everything completely about Jesus' ministry. But to some extent they've got the message. Uh, These things they've understood about the kingdom of God in these parables. uh, They're believing these things and they're prepared to act upon them. Yes, they say. We've got something here, Jesus. We have understood uh, something of what you're telling us. And we should see that already as a tremendous blessing to these disciples. Because Jesus had said earlier in the chapter The parables wouldn't be understood by everyone. Uh, Parables could only be understood with spiritual help. Verse 11. Verse 11. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom. But to them, to others, it has not been given. Verse 16. Blessed are your eyes, disciples. For they see. And your ears, for they hear. So you see, these disciples, they didn't understand because they were smarter than anyone else. Uh, They understood because God had revealed it to, to them. Their eyes had been opened. Their ears had been unblocked. What a blessing for this group of men. What a blessing. And it's a blessing many of us share in this morning. By God's grace, many of us, we understand a great deal about these things We don't understand everything completely, but a great deal. Not because of anything special in us, but because God has been gracious to open eyes and open ears. And so to these privileged and understanding disciples, uh, Jesus says to them, verse 52, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house, who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And it's almost like a mini parable. Uh, Jesus compares these disciples to scribes. Now, scribes have come up before in Matthew's gospel. Uh, They were the recognized theologians of the day, uh, the respected teachers of the day. Uh, They were often found ministering the word of God to others. And you'll know Jesus was constantly having run-ins with the scribes. We talk about the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, So it's interesting. Jesus doesn't call the disciples scribes of the law, but rather scribes trained for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Literally, scribes who have been discipled for the kingdom. Discipled for the kingdom. Think of these men, uh, these disciples, for the most part, common, uneducated, ordinary men. And here's a great honor Jesus is bestowing on them. He's calling them scribes of the kingdom of heaven. 
uh, teachers, theologians for the kingdom of heaven. He likens them further to a master of a house. You might say head of a household. Uh, That is to say, these disciples, they have been blessed in such a way that they are in turn uh, there to provide now for others. Uh, They've been given resources with which they can provide for other people under their care. Uh, They've been entrusted with the knowledge of the kingdom. They are responsible to distribute that knowledge to others. Jesus says, like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And the focus is on setting forth new treasure along with old treasure. Uh, The scribes of Jesus' day were only interested in the old. They were obsessed with the old. They were thoroughly acquainted with the old, the scriptures of the Old Testament. Uh, They had no room in their treasure for anything new. They certainly didn't have room for Jesus as the Messiah. But Jesus says to his disciples, he calls them scribes of the kingdom. And he charges them to bring what is both new and old. Don't despise either the new or the old. And out of all the gospel writers, Matthew is one of the best examples of someone doing this. Old and new being combined together. No one quotes from the Old Testament as much as Matthew does. He looks back time and time again uh, to the Old Testament scriptures, uh, showing how they are completed and fulfilled and perfected in the person and work of Jesus Christ. A beautiful blend of new and old. Paul would put it later in the New Testament, teach the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. And the striking thing uh, to me, friends, is, is whether new or old, Jesus describes both as treasure. Treasure. Treasure that isn't to be kept in a box. It isn't to be kept in a storeroom. But treasure to be, to be brought out for others to see. These disciples, they are called to share this treasure with others. And we are with that, friends. This is to us too, sharing this treasure. Uh, The verb Jesus uses is really quite vivid. Uh, We are to bring it out. Uh, Literally, the word means fling it out, scatter it abroad. Uh, It conveys liberality, richness, abundance. In other words, you've been entrusted with all of this treasure, new and old, Now fling it out, spread it out. And friends, this is so relevant, so relevant for preachers. But it's not restricted to preachers. Whether you're giving a Sunday school lesson, whether you're leading a CY study, whether you're speaking to your arrows group, whether you're leading a midweek, whether you're sharing your testimony with someone, or or leading in family worship, Uh, Or explaining the gospel to someone. What a great honor you have to set forth the treasure of God's word. To fling it out as it were. To handle it with care. Yes. Uh, But seeking to amaze people with God. Incidentally, that's the title of a book by Kevin DeYoung, about introducing young people to Jesus. It's called Amaze Them with God. I think that's really, really helpful. Amaze them with God. What a perspective for those who have this this responsibility. Preachers, teachers, parents. You have the treasure. Now, seek to amaze them. Amaze them with God. What a perspective this has. This is when you come to sit under the ministry of God's word, whether in your daily readings or your family worship or or in weekly worship, when you come to sit under the ministry of the word, 
What treasure will be set forth for us today? What treasure would you have for us today, God? Uh, At the funeral of Queen Elizabeth, the eyes of the world were upon uh, and and focused upon, remember the sparkling crown uh, and the orb uh, and the scepter on top of her coffin. Uh, Part of the collection of crown jewels. Uh, Breathtaking in their beauty, magnificence. Uh, They were treated with the utmost respect and dignity. Uh, Yet even they, uh, just uh, the pride and joy of the crown jewels, even they fade. Uh, They fade into insignificance beside the scriptures. As it was said when the Bible was presented to the late queen on her coronation. This is the most valuable thing that this world affords. And there are some who have the honor of setting forth treasure. Setting forth treasure. That's one response to the ministry of Jesus. Some have the responsibility and the honor of setting forth, holding forth treasure. Uh, But secondly... Some face the danger of getting too familiar. Verses 53 to 58. Some face the danger of getting too familiar. Jesus moves on. Verse 54 describes him coming into his hometown. uh, The little backwater village of Nazareth. Small place of some 500 people, historians tell us at that time. So the kind of place where everybody would know everybody. And Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. It seems his reputation has preceded him. Uh, News would have spread of his miracles, his wonders. Uh, Lame are now walking. Blind are now seeing. The deaf are hearing uh, you can be sure they're telling everyone about it. And so we, we could understand Jesus has been invited probably to, to come and minister the word in the synagogue. And the folk are astonished at his ministry. Amazed. Uh, they've never heard anything quite like the preaching of Jesus. Uh, they say to each other, where did this man get this wisdom And these mighty works, is he not the carpenter's son? Is his mother not Mary? Where did he get all this knowledge? Where did he get all this power? Of course, they've got it backwards, don't they? It's not that Jesus got knowledge or power from anywhere. He didn't gain any wisdom. He didn't gain power from anywhere. He's he's the source, rather. Of wisdom and power. But they can't see it. They can't see it. They they don't want to see it. Uh, The sense of their question really. Is something like. Where then. Did this man. Get all these things. This man. You can almost hear the contempt. In the question. They can't understand. How this man. Standing before them. who, Who grew up in their town who looked like them, talked like them, who who had the same lack of education as them. And yet, here he is, preaching like some great rabbi. He's the one everyone's talking about, the great miracle worker. But where did all that come from? It's not like Jesus belonged to a leading family in Nazareth. Uh, He has no business to them, teaching or healing. What gives him the right to have that kind of platform? They just couldn't accept that somebody from their community has gone higher than they have. And so, yes, they're amazed. They're astonished. But they aren't in awe. They, they aren't in awe. Uh, their amazement doesn't lead them to worship. Uh, Rather, verse 57, they took offense at him. They took offense. Literally, they were scandalized. Uh, They were repelled by him. Uh, They stumbled over the fact that this was the same ordinary, familiar Jesus 
they'd always known. And you see, it is entirely possible to find yourself amazed by Jesus. You could even be astounded, astonished at him. But it doesn't mean squat. It doesn't mean anything if your heart is filled with unbelief. Uh, and these folk, they despise him. They reject him because really they're so familiar with him. Uh, even his own family uh, didn't believe at that time. Uh, John 7 verse 5 tells us, Not even his brothers believed in him. Uh, just maybe by the way, what a word of comfort there is in that, friends. Uh, for those of us this morning who have unbelieving family members, uh, for those of us who will be heading home after worship to, to go to a home, a mixed home in some respects, uh, where there are those who don't share the same faith we have, uh, somewhere that, that really should be the, the safest, most supportive place for a Christian, and yet for some of us it, it's a lonely existence. Jesus knows all about that. Jesus knows all about that. His own brothers, not even his own brothers, believed in him. He responds to, his, uh, to, 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 to these folk in Nazareth. Verse 57. A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. You see, in many other places, he was uh, being received with dignity and respect. But not here. Not here in his hometown. Not even in his household. And you see there is the danger. A real danger of becoming too familiar with the things of God. Uh, becoming too familiar with the Son of God. Uh, we have a saying don't we? Familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, really, this is a case of familiarity breeding unbelief. Breeding unbelief. There are few blessings greater in life than growing up in a Christian home. Uh, boys and girls this morning, what a blessing it is. God has given you a Christian home. He's given you a place where you can be encouraged and brought along to meetings in the church and learn about God from your parents. What a blessing that is. What a privilege that is. Uh, there are some of us this morning and we know nothing else than that kind of environment. Uh, for some of us, our lives from our earliest days have been orientated around the church and, and around Jesus. Uh, there are some this morning here and we don't remember a time when we didn't love Jesus Christ. And there are others of us, uh, and we can look back and we can see how God wonderfully intervened in our lives, uh, bringing us to our knees uh, and then adding us to the church. But even for those of us in that category, uh, we've still been around Jesus a long time, most of us. So whatever group, Whatever your background, there is the real danger of, of becoming so familiar with Jesus that you're, you're really just no longer impressed by him. You're no longer amazed by him. Uh, so familiar that you've sort of lost sight uh, of the treasure that he is. And that's a scary thing. That's a serious thing. It's entirely possible for us to be like these people of Nazareth in Jesus' day. We like to holiday around the north coast and uh, in Bush Mills particularly. And every summer it's clear that in Bush Mills, people from all around the world come to see the Giants Causeway. Uh, busloads. Are, are, are carried into Bush Mills. The tourists, they are stunned by the breathtaking scenery, those hexagonal rocks. Uh, they come from all over. And yet there are people who live a stone's throw from the Giant's Causeway. It's literally on their doorsteps. But it's become so familiar, so run-of-the-mill, so humdrum, 
that it never really takes their breath away at all anymore. So familiar, they've become unimpressed by it. And there is that real danger for some of us when it comes to Jesus. We have an embarrassment of riches, friends. The greatest of all treasure. And we could stumble over its familiarity. Like the spoiled child who wants for nothing when it comes to toys and games and gadgets and books. Uh, and yet still they complain of boredom. There, there are a few things more dangerous than being bored with Jesus. Being bored with Jesus. Uh, sure, you can be bored from time to time with the sermon. I grant you that. But be very careful if Jesus becomes dull to you, ordinary to you. We have the frighteningly solemn words at the end of the chapter, verse 58. Jesus did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He hadn't come to put on a show. He wasn't there as a traveling healer. He had come to call these people to faith and repentance. But these people who knew him best stumbled and took offense, rejecting the Savior. And because of their unbelief, Jesus didn't do many miracles there. And from now on, their days of exposure to Jesus were numbered. The folk in Nazareth. Friends, really for all of us, our days of exposure to this treasure chest of riches, our days of exposure are numbered themselves. May it not be so that familiarity breeds unbelief. May we not be complacent. May we never get bored of Jesus, but rather always grow in our amazement and our wonder and our awe and our worship of him. Amen.